Hello there and welcome back to another video here on Wrist Watch Revival. My name is Marshall. Thank you so much for coming along. This time on the bench, we have this beautiful Omega Seamaster DeVille. This one dates to 1966 or maybe 1967 when its original owner purchased it. That's right, he still owns it. His name's Don. And in 1966, he was in the US Army stationed in Germany and he bought it at the Army PX in Stuttgart. So he went there and bought this watch himself. And he says, I've always treasured it and wore it almost every day until about 30 years ago when he stored it in his dresser at his house in New York. And since then, he's had it in a Ziploc bag down in Florida where he retired there in 1999 with his wife. And uh, he says it's never been immersed in water. So that's good news. Uh, that being said, it hasn't really been touched since then either. And um, here's the thing with this watch. And this is one of the reasons why I love restoring watches like this. This watch is going to go to his only grandson as he wishes in his will when he passes on. So he wants to get this thing serviced and... Uh, running and, and looking great so that when it gets handed down uh, eventually that uh, his grandson can enjoy it for many, many years to come and maybe even think of his grandfather, Don. Let's take a look at how it's doing on the uh, time grapher. As it is running, it is running quite poorly. As you can see, low amplitude and the, uh, the watch is running about 20 something seconds off a day. All told, not actually that bad, and I'm not sh shocked. This is an Omega. This is a very nice watch. Uh, Omega is a massive manufacturer of watches to this day, and they make really good stuff. Also, some of my favorite movements come from Omega, and hopefully this one will not be the exception to that rule. But yeah, we're going to go ahead and get this thing running and restored and looking and feeling and uh, behaving the best that it possibly can for Don. If you take a close look here on the side, you can see a groove in the upper part of the case there. And that's actually a groove for a case knife, just like this one. This will allow me to separate out the bezel, which holds the crystal from the base part of the movement. And this case is actually kind of a strange one. Wow, this thing's in really good shape. I gotta say, Don did a great job taking care of it. But yeah, this case is different than the normal ones we work on here. The movement actually comes out of the front. The back is one piece, but that means in order to take out the winding stem and crown, we have to do this. Oh, it feels so weird to do it, but this has a split stem. It has a stem that part of it sits in the movement and part of it sits in the crown. You see the little jaws at the end of it that grab on that grabs on to the part that sits in the movement. And now I can just move this movement ring around the outside to unlock the movement. And it should just come out. I've only worked on a couple of these, but uh, they're they're actually pretty easy to work on. Yeah, and there you go. You can see the movement. Well, yeah, there we go. Just comes right out. The whole back of the case is solid. It's it's a block, so it doesn't unscrew or pop off or anything like that. So we'll go ahead and uh, take the hands off of the watch now. And I've got a little special box here that I used to hold the hands. It's a, it's called a membrane box. It has a thin film of plastic suspended in the middle on both the top and the bottom part of the box. And that way the hands just don't get banged around or lost or bent up or, you know, any of the many things that can happen to watch hands when they're neglected. As you can see, this movement is flat out gorgeous. Oh, I love these movements from Omega from the 60s. This one is an automatic. As you can see, that's the winding rotor. Now, first though, I do want to take off the rest of the stem here. And I also will note, as you probably noticed, there is some rust. Now, he said this thing hasn't been submerged, so it looks like it's only on the stem where a little bit of water could have gotten in just from humidity or whatever. But we are going to have to address that down the line to make sure that that stem is still structurally able to be functional. In the meantime, I can take off the dial. God, that dial's in good shape. Oh, the back's kind of interesting. You can see where the indices are adhered or probably soldered into place in this case. And then I can put the dial in a dial box and continue with 
the disassembly. This is the calendar side, the dial side of the watch here. And as you can see, this one does have hours, minutes, seconds, and then a calendar wheel here as well. And you can see it just separates off from that disc. And I'm just gonna use a dial holder for the calendar as well. Again, you just kind of can't be too careful with these parts, right? You just don't need them floating around in a box where they're gonna get damaged. And now we can continue taking apart some of the motion works. These are the little gears here and wheels that uh, turn the hands and the calendar. This one's actually the one that turns calendar itself. And that leaves us the Canon pinion that we need to remove, but thankfully I have a tool for that. This is a Canon pinion removal tool. It grips the sides of the Canon pinion, which is friction fit, and pulls it off safely, just like that. And you can see the Canon pinion comes free. That also reminds me, you know, I get asked a lot on the channel about which tools you should get if you wanna start watchmaking as a hobby, which I highly recommend. I think it's an amazing hobby, and I think you can do it even if you don't think you can do it. <laughs> but uh, people ask me all the time which tools to get because there's so many, it can be really daunting. And after being asked this for quite a long time, I realized that I wanted to make my own kits. I also get asked about where people can purchase the watches that I've restored on the channel quite often as well, and I thought, you know what? I need to start a website. So I teamed up with a good friend of mine, Alex Hansen, and we created a website called SutcliffeHanson.com. That's my last name and his last name. And on it, you can find custom curated toolkits that I personally made. I tested every tool on them and I picked, again, what I thought was the best combination of price and uh, how good quality and all that kind of stuff the tools are. We also have the watches that I've restored on the channel for auction there, where they go up one at a time. There's one on there right now, in fact, as well as a pre-owned and vintage watch section and a section for watch straps uh, that are some of my favorites as well with more to come in that section as well. I'm really excited to launch the website. We've actually been working on it for over a year to try to get it right and to get it so that I felt good about bringing it to you. And uh, it is now ready. I'd love it if you check it out. There's a link in the description. It is SutcliffeHanson.com. So yeah, that's been a really fun journey that Alex and I have uh, undertaken and I hope you like it. We'll continue uh, with the disassembly of the watch here. And I, again, I not only are these Omega movements well made, they are flat out gorgeous. I mean, they are so pretty, aren't they? They, There's something about the way they shine under the lights too that is just awesome. This one's a, every, most movements uh, have a reference number or a caliber number. They they name them, right? And that way they you can sort of track them over time. They'll take a base movement and then they'll make small improvements and up the number of it. This one's a 565. You can see the number right on that bridge there. And this one again is an automatic with a calendar. And let's see how the uh, train of wheels looks underneath. Looks beautiful. There's a few small signs that this movement needs a service and I'm not shocked that it wasn't running super well, but all in all, this thing's in beautiful shape. This is definitely the kind of watch that you can be proud to hand down to family members down the line. Little tiny screw here to hold on this retention spring. This thing just, or tension spring, this thing just puts a little bit of tension on this pinion right here, which is actually what the second hand ends up being attached to. And you know, I'm gonna do something I don't often do, but I'm actually gonna put this screw back because it's kind of a, it, it, it's a one-off and it's its own kind of unique screw and I don't wanna misplace it or accidentally put it on somewhere else. So I'm just gonna put it back in its spot. You can do that when you're learning especially. At some point it becomes kind of unnecessary but it's it's good trick to have just in case. As you can see the center wheel is stuck to the barrel bridge here and yeah, it's just a little gummy, you know, and, and that's the kind of thing that happens when a watch just needs to be serviced. The oils will have dried up and, and it's uh, 
makes it a little bit difficult. But I mean, again, this thing's in really good shape. I'm not worried about it. It's just a good indicator that it's been 25 years since it's been serviced. And, you know, it is important to have your watches serviced, particularly if you are planning on keeping them for the long term for yourself or if you're going to pass them down to family members. You want to make sure that you keep them in pretty good shape. Because what will usually happen is, is that if you don't service them, they'll wear. But it's not the end of the world. But if it if they wear too much, they can get out of hand, you know, and you can really kind of start to ruin some parts and need some more extensive care. They also can, you know, a lot of times when you bring them in for service, they'll replace gaskets and stuff like that to make sure that it stays water resistant. And if you neglect that, sometimes you can get water in the movement. And we've all seen what happens when water gets in the movement. If you've watched my channel for very long at all, you've, you've seen some pretty gnarly examples of that. Kilos Works comes apart quite nicely here. This is the last couple of pieces to take apart. There's this retention spring for the setting lever. The setting lever itself, and then there's this extra little part for the quick change mechanism. And it all just comes apart quite nicely. Now we can take apart the automatic works. Again, this being an automatic watch, is really simple. It means that it takes the energy from this big rot rotor that says Omega Watch Co. on it there. And when it swings around is when it winds up your watch. And that sounds like a really simple thing to do. And it's a little more complicated than you might think. But not a lot. To me, the most impressive thing about it is that it just works really well. You know, an automatic watch, you never have to wind it if you wear it, like often. Most of the watches will go, depending on how old they are and some other factors about the mainspring, they'll go for somewhere between 40, 24 to, you know, 48 hours is like the most common. You can see there's a reversing wheel that needs to come out of the uh, automatic works here. But yeah, so I mean, theoretically, you know, if you wear the watch every day, you never have to wind it, ever. Okay, now the last thing to take apart here from the movement side is the mainspring. And it's housed in the mainspring barrel. It's wrapped around the barrel arbor right here. That comes out nicely as well. And then we can just take out the mainspring itself. And in order to do this, we kind of rock the mainspring out by hand. It's really the only way to do it. There it is. Actually looks like it's in pretty good shape as well. And now we can transfer all of the parts of the watch, every single one, <laughs> into these little mesh baskets. And then that, those will be put into a bigger mesh basket, which will then be put into the watch cleaning machine. This is, of course, a very important step in servicing a watch is to make sure that everything is clean, 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 clean. There's the mainspring going in the top. And a machine that does it is a good way to do it. Now, before we actually put it in the cleaning machine, let's take a look at this crystal. It looks like it's got some wear. You can see the scratches on it. So normally I would just replace this, but if we look really closely on this crystal, do you see the little Omega symbol right there? That means this is the original crystal on this watch. It's actually never been changed out. And that's going to change what I want to do with it. So later on, we'll address the crystal. Here's the bracelet. This is a, a plated gold bracelet. It's nothing special for the era, but it goes nicely with the watch. Uh, I'm not going to do anything special with it other than clean it. This is the crown with that split stem. And as you can see, there is some rust on here. This is the stem itself that it mates with. And yeah, uh, I was hoping there wouldn't be rust. This isn't too bad, but it is real rust. That isn't just staining. So what I'm going to do is before we put the watch in the watch cleaning machine, I'm going to put the stem and the crown into uh, Evaporust, which is a de-ruster. It'll convert the rust into a different substance that can just be cleaned away. And we'll see what we've got underneath. So here's the watch cleaning machine itself. And this is of course, where uh, we actually clean all the watch parts. They're submersed in this liquid. There's actually three different liquids. And uh, yeah, 
through agitation, they are cleaned. While the watch is being clean, I did want to mention I've got a Patreon for my channel. And if you like what I'm doing here and you'd like to support me, you can head over to patreon.com slash wristwatch revival and you can support me. It's really cool. You can do any amount you want. Basically, this is a way to support the content creators that you love, whether it's videos or podcasts or music or artwork or whatever. Most content creators will have a Patreon at this point. And it's just a way to support them so that they can keep making the things that you really love. I know I support a bunch of people on Patreon, and uh, I thank every each and every one of you who supports me on Patreon. Patreon Again, if you'd like to, it's patreon.com slash wristwatch revival. Now, taking a look at the movement all laid out, not too bad. Quite a few parts thanks to the uh, calendar works and all that, but it's a beautiful movement, whether it's laid out or not. Now let's take a look at how our de-rusting project went. This is um, a couple of days. I usually give it at least one day. And then what we can do is give it a rinse. So I'll rinse it off in some distilled water. And that's just to get the evaporust off of it, even though the evaporust is actually really nice. It's, it's not a super harsh chemical. This is isopropyl alcohol, IPA, and that's to displace the water that was put on there. And then I can just dry it off using a hand blower here. And that'll allow us to inspect and see what we've actually got going on. But before we do, I can also use a fiberglass brush. The bristles here are made are a fiberglass, so they're kind of an abrasive. And that'll allow me to clean up the surface and to really see what we've got. Because the rust can be anything from a stain that just discolors all the way up until something that really eats away at the metal and leaves it weaker with severe pitting and, and basically needing to replace parts. With a watch like this, I really, really try to keep as many original parts as possible because this is the watch that Don bought in Germany in the 60s, and I wanna keep it that way when it makes its way to his grandson. Now, as you can see, there is the pitting, but this actually isn't too bad. That rust is completely gone, and this, uh, this looks a little worse. Hmm, there's definitely enough material there to hold. We're gonna have to just hope that that will be functional and not break, although I wouldn't be surprised if it did. So taking a look at the mainspring, you see this curve, and then there's this little flap that comes off the side here. That actually pushes up against the inside of the wall. And as a result of it scraping and spinning along there, we need to put what's called braking grease along the inner wall so that that flap has something to kind of nudge up against it isn't just metal on metal. So I can take this braking grease and put just a small amount just on the wall in three or four spots around the outer wall and that'll provide enough slippage there that it's sort of tuned so that it slips enough so that it isn't damaging the rest of the parts from not being able to be wound but it also doesn't slip enough so that it's just flying around. Now we get to use one of my absolute favorite tools. This is the mainspring winder. So we take the handle out and then we'll pick the appropriate size for this mainspring. And we can put the winder on top of the handle here, just like that. And the handle actually mimics what the mainspring will be hanging onto inside the watch, which is the barrel arbor that we looked at earlier. And that part there that I'm putting it on has the same shape and function as the barrel arbor. It's just reversed. That'll allow me now to wind this mainspring into the winder, carefully, of course. And when we get to that flap at the end, I gotta be a little careful here just to make sure that it gets safely inserted into the winder and then I can finish winding it all the way in. And once it's all the way wound in, I can take my tweezers and very carefully separate out the handle. And then we'll have the mainspring nestled safely, hopefully, in the winder. There it goes. It's a little bit of a learning curve on a tool like this, no doubt about it, but take a look. There's the mainspring in there. And now, the fun part. Oh, <laughs> I love that. It's so nice. It just snaps right into place and look how beautifully it just sits in its, in its home. It's back home again. 
Now I can put the arbor back into place and then a little bit of medium viscosity oil on the top where it meets up with the lid of the barrel. And once that's done, then the whole mainspring assembly with the barrel, the arbor, the spring, it's all done. I like to use this little plastic tool to, uh, to put the lid back on. All it does is just apply even pressure along the top so that it safely secures it. You can use tweezers to do it too. I just find this tool to be a little better. Okay, center wheel. This is the one that was a little bit stuck, but as you can see, it's all cleaned up and pretty now. So we'll start by putting that into place. I'll also make sure I put in the barrel. You can just kind of sneak it underneath here. And then I can put on the barrel bridge. Now the barrel bridge is aptly named. Its primary function is to provide the rigidity on top of that barrel as there is actually quite a bit of torque that goes through it. The thing about the barrel though is that it spins very, very slowly. So it is, even though it is being torqued to the side a little bit, it spins so slowly that it's not considered, you know, an insane friction part. But where it does meet up with that, uh, with that bridge is a common failure point. That's also why I'm using a little bit of medium viscosity oil between where it meets up with that uh, barrel bridge. Again, we're thinking longevity here, right? Same thing with a little bit of oil for the center wheel, and then we can go for the train of wheels. The first one that goes in is the escape wheel, which is, that's kind of the, the oddball, right? That one's a different color, and it has obviously a much different pattern on the wheel itself. It's an absolutely ingenious design. The fact that, I don't know, that we as humans came up with these things and when we did and that they actually worked, <laughs> it always fascinates me. I just, I don't know. I just can't imagine being somebody, you know, from the 1600s or 1700s being shown a schematic for a, a watch like this and thinking like, yeah, that'll work. <laughs> that'll go. <laughs> but they did. Of course, the ones from back then were more rudimentary than this one is. This is quite a refined design by comparison. Okay, now we can get the uh, train of wheels and the train wheel bridge going again. There we go. I tell you, the, the better made the movement, the easier that operation is. Flat out. I've, I've done it on a ton of different brands now. And the really good brands like Rolex and Omega, it, they just fall back into place. It's precision manufacturing adds up, good design adds up, and it makes them a real joy to work on. Okay, now we can go for the ratchet wheel. We'll set it in place and put a little bit of lubricant there where the shoulder of the screw will be rubbing up against it. Whoop, there we go. And just make sure it's good and tight. And as you can see, it actually, the power flows through the train of wheels because there's nothing on the other end to hold it back currently. Now we can do the crown wheel. Cool design here, it's got an offset screw so that it holds it in place and won't come undone. All right, so we can get this thing secured. And there we go, looking good. Now we can turn the movement over and start reassembling the keyless works. There's something very cathartic about putting back together the entire watch. It, I don't know, it brings a real sense of accomplishment when it's finished. It's also part of the reason why I, I really make sure to show you every part of the journey so you can come along with me for the whole thing. Can put the clutch wheel into place now. And that'll meet up with the sliding clutch here. 
this is uh, the blue stuff that I'm putting. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll use a little bit of Rodico because that guy fell in a hole somehow. Uh, the blue stuff is grease. It's a specific type of grease called Mobius 9501. And it's made to be kind of the heavy duty lubricant for a watch like this. We can continue again. Remember that spring. And that holds the setting lever in place until you want to take out the uh, winding stem. You press down. It pushes that spring down just long enough for you to be able to slide the, the winding stem out. The red uh, oil that I'm using here is a medium viscosity oil. It's called Mobius. That's the company that makes the synthetic oils that are most commonly used these days in watchmaking. And this one's called HP 1300. And again, it's used for medium. You know, medium friction applications is I think how they would put it. Uh, here's the born to fly spring. This is the spring on the yoke. And okay, okay, there we go. Actually, that wasn't too bad at all. You can see I, I use that pointer stick to make sure that it's held into place just because that thing freaks me out. I've had them fly away. This is that weird part that uh, allows an additional functionality on this movement. So I mentioned that this one has hours, minutes, seconds, and date. It also has a quick set date on many watches from this era. You would have to wind the watch forward 24 hours to make the date click over one notch from the 21st to the 22nd. I mean, it takes a while. And if you look down at your watch, you haven't worn it in a little while, and today is the 8th, and your watch says it's the 10th, you got a lot of winding to do. So they started to come up with mechanisms that would allow you to change just the date part without the time. And this one has kind of an interesting one. Uh, if you may have noticed at the beginning when we were inspecting, uh, you actually pull the crown out one step to get it to time setting. And then if you pull it again, it has a spring-loaded clicker. And each time you pull it out, it puts the date over by one. And that's what that extra little part was that we just put in. This is the uh, setting lever spring. And now, yeah, I mean, this gets a little bit weird because of the stem being split like this. I Normally they're together, the crown is on the end of it, and so it makes it a little easier to handle, but I suppose I can just put this part of the crown in and then just sort of wedge this part on when it's in a tube it's it's actually held in place but when it's not it kind of flops around a little bit but there we go all right <laughs> i guess that works we can flip the movement back over now and we can put in the pallet fork this is where things start to get really interesting because when you get to this part of the rebuild is when the excitement starts to build because you're starting to get to the point of putting the balance in, and the balance is when you get to find out if the dang thing's going to run. Put these two screws to hold the pallet fork bridge in place after securing it. I do need to try to give this watch a little bit of a wind. Yeah, okay, I can still do it. You do need to have a little bit of power in it, or the watch won't run, of course. And this is a good way to check to make sure that power is being transferred down the train to the fork. You see it jumps off of the tweezers. And that leaves us with the moment of truth. It is time to put on the balance and see if it'll run. Come on. No? Ooh, there she goes. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh man, there's a lot of parts of this hobby that I really love. You know, I love putting the mainspring back in. I love oiling the jewels, that kind of stuff. But there is nothing better than when that thing kicks back on again. It is awesome. And I'm glad to see this watch is running. And we're gonna get it running even better because right now it's running dry. There's no oil at all. Uh, on this movement. So we need to oil up these jewels. So the first thing I'll do is take off the cap jewel here. 
you can see it. And then these are the regular oil. The, and these again are the Mobius 90 Tennis, the thinnest, lightest, least friction oil that we put on a watch. And that's for performance, of course. Now this is called a cap jewel, and one side of it faces down and actually has oil between it and the end of the pivot. But it can get a little bit of gunk on it, even through the watch cleaning machine. And so I like to use some peg wood to wipe it and clean it, put it back into this solvent, and then I'll get a perfectly clean surface to do this. Boop, just like that, a tiny little droplet of Movius 9010, again, that's the lightest viscosity oil, and then I can put the cap back in the setting, and it'll automatically stick in, thanks to capillary action, and then I can just put this back in its housing, though it looks like I missed. <laughs> Come on. Come on. There we go. And once I get that in there, I can then replace the shock setting that goes on top. That's this sort of brass spring. And now the thing is running beautifully. And with that, let's put it on the time grapher. And after a little bit of tweaking, fiddling, adjusting, and regulating, we've got it to about four, five seconds a day and no beat error and a good healthy amplitude. That is a very good result. And I have to say, I'm not surprised. This is a very nice watch that was already running and uh, it just needed a service. That's all it needed to get it running to tip top shape again. And I'm really happy to see that. Now we can put some of the calendar works back together here. Again, this is on what we call the dial side of the movement. This is actually not the dial here. This is the calendar ring and the calendar ring retainer. And the dial will, of course, go on top of that. Oh, did you see that? It's working. Ding, ding. So when I pull out the stem, it jumped over the calendar by one day each time. And that's, of course, the important thing there. Now we can assemble the automatic winding works once again. And again, this is a really important part of the watch that is also optional. Isn't that interesting? You could... Like I could just leave all of these parts off of the watch and it would be perfectly functional. Now what it wouldn't do is wind itself. So you would have to take the crown every morning and wind it up. But the watch would work, it would keep time and you know, it would do all the things. But of course this watch is designed to be an automatic watch. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, put back together the automatic winding works and put it back on. And just a little bit of oil on the pivots for this too to make sure that it can run freely and efficiently. And here's that center seconds pinion. Again, this goes right through the center of the center wheel. There's actually a hole. And that is what I'm going to put the seconds hand on later. It actually attaches to the tip of that. And uh, there's that screw that I left in place. So that worked out pretty well. Now this part's very tricky because this spring is so thin. I mean, it is paper thin. And it's just very tricky because it kind of wants to move around because of how thin it is. Oh, hang on. Okay, not bad. I can just tighten it down a little bit, not all the way, but just get it started so that I can set the spring properly on top of that pinion and then I can finish tightening it all the way down when I'm comfortable. Okay, so there's a done deal there. Now I can put in some attention here on the case and the crystal and that kind of stuff. So first off, let's do an ultrasonic clean. And this is a, a machine that is very, very handy to have as a watchmaker, a hobbyist watchmaker. And frankly, it's just handy to have in the house you can clean a bunch of stuff with this that you wouldn't think. You can put your sunglasses in here. You can put jewelry of any type in here almost. Um, you can clean like makeup brushes. You know, you can clean those off, all different types of stuff. Uh, but I usually just use it 
for the watch stuff. So let's take a look first at this crystal. Now I mentioned it before, this is the original Omega crystal with that Omega crest in the center of it and I wanna keep it. So instead of doing the replacement, I'm going to restore this crystal and I'm gonna use a technique uh, called wet sanding to do it. So I can take one of my sanding sticks. This one is, I believe, uh, 2000 or 1500 grit or something like that. Um, and what I can do is use just a little bit of water to help sand down the acrylic crystal surface. And I'll do this over three stages working my way up. Actually, it'll end up being four stages total. And as you can see, that's what it looks like after the first sanding. Not great, right? It's all foggy and doesn't look good, but that's because that's the first one. That's to knock down those bigger scratches that we saw on there. And now I can work my way up yet another grit level and I'll do a, a third one as well. And I'll show you what it looks like after it's been done with all three levels here. And that's what it looks like. Now, as you can see, it's pretty foggy. It's not exactly crystally quite yet, but we have one more step that we can do. We can use polywatch, which is really great uh, polishing compound for specifically made for acrylic crystals. And I can just take a cotton cloth and give it a good thorough polish. This takes about three to three to four minutes, which doesn't sound like much, but it kind of feels like forever when you're going at it. But look at the result. How much better is that? A beautiful original Omega crystal. And we get to keep this watch all original, even the crystal, which I think is great. Take a look at this case back, like I said, once again. And uh, here's the bracelet. It cleaned up really nicely, actually. And again, I'm not gonna be doing anything to the bracelet. It is plated gold. So if you polish it, it's too likely that it'll just break through and you'll see the brass underneath. Here's the uh, spring bars though. And I don't know what the heck happened here. They are not matched and they're both bent up. So I got some new ones. Here's some brand new matching. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> spring bars. And those will go into the bracelet to make sure that it stays attached to the case safely and that the watch doesn't come flying off. Now, in order to set the time, I'm gonna use a pin vise here because I just can't get a grip on the thing. And I'm gonna move it right until there. That is right when it became the 15th, which means it is midnight, which is exactly where I'm gonna put the hands up at 12 o'clock. And that way, when we turn the, when the watch turns over, Midnight is exactly when the calendar will go to the next day so that it remains accurate. If you wake up at 1130 at night and you look and you say, okay, it's 1130 on the 15th. And then if you wake up an hour later, boom, it'll be the 16th and you'll know what day it is. So there's the hour hand and now the minute hand going on. I have to say this dial is flat out gorgeous and in really good shape. You know, it's interesting because Don said that he wore this watch for a long time, but then there's been a long time that he hasn't worn the watch. And I have to say that he took good care of it while wearing it, but the fact that he put it in a bag and just sort of left it in a drawer for the past 25, 30 years or whatever, that didn't hurt this thing either. It is in really good shape as a result of his care and also the fact that he hasn't worn it that much. Okay, now we can put the automatic winding works back on because normally you can do this after you've cased the watch, but here we can't because this one goes face up into the case and we won't have access to the back at all. So normally, again, you would do this after, but uh, and I would have if I had remembered, but I didn't. So we just have to do it now. So the, the automatic winding works goes on and now the rotor. Little tiny baby screw that holds this retainer in place, but it's a good design, they don't come out. And then there's these two case clamps that go on the outside. And these are actually what interact with that kind of interesting case lock design where you, you, if you remember at the beginning, I untwisted that part on the inside of the case to free it up. And I'll have to put that back on right here as well. So first we line up the crown or the stem, excuse me, make sure that the thing's seated and now watch. 
See how I move that outer ring? That locks the movement and the dial and everything into place. A little bit of air to make sure that there's no dust. And I'm so happy with how that crystal came out, by the way. How beautiful is that? And then I can just click on the case once again. And holy smokes, does this thing look awesome. Now I've got to test out the crown. Let's see if it'll engage. We basically need it to stick to... Oh... Okay. Yes. Okay. It actually works still. Oh, that's a big relief because it can be difficult to find crowns and stems and stuff for these split stem ones. And, uh, I'm, I'm relieved that it still had enough meat on the bone to work. Got to make sure before I put the bracelet back on that each of these little end link pieces are the right orientation. As you can see, they are just bent links, so you don't want the folded part to be sitting up where you can see it. Brand new uh, spring bars going in as well, and uh, this thing is just about in the books. All we have to do is uh, attach the bracelet, and it will be a done deal. This is such a cool family story for Don. He bought this watch in the 60s while he was in the army and stationed in Germany. He wore it for a long time, then hang, hung on to it. And now his plan is to pass it on to his only grandson when he passes away, hopefully in a very long time. Thank you, Don, for your service. And uh, also for thinking of your family. That is really, really cool of you. And look how beautiful this watch came out. It is absolutely stunning. And it's even running really well to boot. And hopefully it'll be in your family for a long, long time. Thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate you taking the time to hang out with me on one of my crazy watch journeys. If you want to find me on Instagram, I am wristwatch underscore revival. And with that, I just wanted to say thank you and we'll see you next time.